All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 8, Section 2, The New American Republic. So recall we are in the presidency, or we're in the very first presidency of George Washington. 8.1, the section below, talked about the most pressing issue in the country, and that, of course, was the economy and how Alexander Hamilton really changed the U.S. economy and led, this, led to this economic recovery. Uh, here in 8.2, we're going to look at some of the other issues going on in the nation during Washington's time in office. Probably the most important one being the French Revolution. So the French Revolution was somewhat similar to the American Revolution. It was inspired by the Enlightenment. At the time, France had an absolute monarch who was Louis XVI, an absolute monarch. Uh, which pretty much meant that whatever Louis the Sixteenth uh, Louis the Sixteenth said pretty much went, and so all of those ideas regarding the social contract and government by the people for the people that inspired the people of France more or less to take Louis the Sixteenth uh, uh, hostage more or less, and to create a constitutional monarchy. So there would be a king, so Louis would keep his job, but he would have much more limited power that this would be a government that was more democratic. And at first, this went pretty smooth. However, Louis XVI didn't like the fact that his power was now going to be limited, so he attempted to escape. He was caught and charged with treason and was executed by the French people. And this image here is showing the king being executed by one of the newer executing technologies of the day and that is this device here called the guillotine which would behead somebody and kill them very quickly and very efficiently uh, and so once the king was killed once louis the 16th was 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 beheaded it sent france into a much more radical period uh, a period known as the terror and this was sort of deep suspicion of anybody who might be what they called a counter-revolutionary. And during the terror, they killed tens of thousands of people. It said, you know, blood ran in the streets. Because essentially what France was trying to do was to create a new nation that was unlike anything that had been created before. Not only did the, the French people want a new government, but they went so far as to even change things like the months of the year, the dating system, you know, because the French revolutionaries believed they were creating a new world, they started over the whole dating system with year one, year two, just to give you kind of an idea of how important that many of these individuals thought that this was. And so anybody who could potentially be a counter-revolutionary, well, there was very little uh, patience for that and tens of thousands of people were, were killed. And so the way that the French Revolution plays out, and one more thing to add on top of that, is that France, as a result of beheading their own king, goes to war more or less with the world, in a sense, right? All these other countries that have monarchs, all these other uh, you know, governments that are trying to keep their power, uh, they don't want to be beheaded like the French king was, declare war on France, right? And so this is you know, what we might call the French Revolutionary Wars. Maybe most importantly, they declare war on Britain. And this sort of sets up a specific dichotomy then in the United States, which begs the question, does the United States support France or does the United States support Britain? And the American public is, is, is split on this. So the Federalists support England or support Britain, right? So the Federalists, I probably misspelled that somewhere. Uh, Federalists, there's extra I. Uh, support Great Britain in this war, and the Democratic Republicans favor France. And that makes sense, right? Because really what the Federalists fear, right? They fear anarchy and chaos. And the way that the French Revolution had transpired with the terror and the guillotine, uh, you know, that was that was no good. What do the Democratic Republicans fear? Well, they fear tyranny, 
And of course, what better if you fear tyranny than to execute the king? And so they are firmly on the side of the French Revolution. So uh, American society is completely divided on this issue. George Washington does something very important, and that is he declares America's neutrality, right? So neutral means that the U.S. will not pick a side, right? Will not pick a side. That ultimately doesn't sit very well with both Great Britain and, and France, who are disappointed that the U.S. isn't choosing their side. The French send over Edmund Charles Genet, giving him a letters of mark, which gives him, gives Genet power, essentially, to recruit, recruit Americans for war with Britain. All right, so Washington says, look, we're going to stay out of this. The French send over this guy, Citizen Genet, who comes in and, and, you know, to some, especially to the Democratic Republicans who really want to help France in this war, uh, to recruit Americans, right, for this war effort against Great Britain. This ultimately leads to problems with Britain now because American ships are being used to capture British ships. And so British ships are now capturing American ships. And this, this desire to try to stay out of it uh, is very difficult for the United States to pull off. But of course, Washington does his best. This is, of course, called the Citizen Genet Affair. You can think of this as, you know, France disregarding U.S. neutrality, right? No regard for American neutrality. Now, because problems are now ramping up with Great Britain, the British see something like Citizen Genet and say, look, the Americans are clearly siding with the British. So let's sort of, uh, you know, let's not think twice about confiscating American ships or stepping on the American toes. And the British don't hesitate to do that either. Jay's treaty, John Jay, is a treaty, we're running a little bit out of room here, is a treaty with Britain. All right, treaty with Britain. It allows the United States to confiscate some of the frontier posts. These are posts on the Western frontier that haven't fully been evacuated since the American Revolution. It allows for Americans to trade uh, openly, right? American shipping is allowed to pass through British areas. The British won't harass them. However, the Jay Treaty does not solve this problem of impressment. And impressment is a good term to be familiar with because it's something that's going to go on in the United States for the next few decades. Impressment is the practice of, and we'll say kidnapping, excuse my spelling, uh, US citizens and forcing them to serve in Britain's, we'll just say Navy for now, but it could be Army also, right? So impressment is the practice of kidnapping US citizens and forcing them to serve in Britain's Navy, right? Sometimes in the British military. This was something that the British did to their own citizens, but again, a complete lack of regard, complete disregard for American neutrality and this issue of impressment will increase and become a bigger problem to for Americans who obviously object to it. Now the French Revolution was underway in France and because the United States was across the Atlantic Ocean it could it could maintain some semblance of neutrality despite the fact that you know you had citizen Genet running around the US and you had the British you know kidnapping American citizens. Uh, however, it did have a, a pretty profound impact on the Caribbean, and that was because during the one of the most radical phases of the French Revolution, along with this phase, uh, you know, described by the Terror, you had the abolition of slavery. Right during one of the more radical phases, the abolition of slavery. What that meant was that uh, slaves in the French colony of Haiti. Uh, the island is called Saint Domingue, so this was a uh, this was France's uh, 
sugar, and we'll also write slaves because it was mostly slaves who lived there. Uh, France's sugar slash slave colony. And when the French declared an abolition of slavery, Toussaint Louverture, who became the leader of this revolutionary movement, this is a picture of Louverture right here, uh, led a slave revolution, which ultimately led to an independent Haiti. This is the only slave revolt turned to an independence movement, and it was inspired by Enlightenment principles. Uh, this was concerning for the United States for one particular reason, and that was because that slave revolt had been successful, it created a sense of anxiety for US slaveholders, whereas Democratic Republicans, and you had some who were cheering on the French Revolution, they might take a sort of a second thought, fearing that the fact that slaves had successfully revolted in Haiti would only inspire slaves in the United States, particularly in the South, to be motivated and rise up in revolution as well. So there was more of a fear that possibly the French Revolution could lead to slave revolts in the US. Uh, the French Revolution remains, you know, by the time that Washington exits office, the French Revolution is still being waged. In fact, it's going to go on for the presidencies of Adams, Jefferson, Monroe, Madison, or Madison Monroe. Uh, however, Washington probably did the best job of keeping the U.S. neutral, even though it was very much difficult. Domestically, there are kind of two issues at work here, right? So the French Revolution is going on overseas. It divides American society. Who supports France? Who supports Britain? Again, they're fighting uh, one another in a war essentially for 25 years. Uh, one is the Whiskey Rebellion, and that is the rural population. And the Indian question, or you know, what's the United States policy, specifically Washington, towards Native Americans? Well, the Whiskey Rebellion was inspired by Hamilton's task, uh, tax. Excuse me. You mostly had farmers. This was in Pennsylvania who protest the tax based off of their own personal freedoms. You know, they use the same slogan that was said during the American Revolution. That was no taxation without representation. This time it's not the British government that's taxing them, but rather it is the United States government that's taxing them. And they got more or less a, a, a you know, they, they, they more or less endorsed the democratic republican principle that there ought to be lower taxes more personal freedoms and in fact there were many farmers out here that not only refused to pay the tax but also tarred and feathered and assaulted tax collectors who did washington's response to this rebellion in western pennsylvania was very very important this was a strong military response right Washington raised an army of some 13,000 soldiers and threatened to march out to Pennsylvania and more or less put them in their place. This is a picture of Washington leading the Whiskey Rebellion. No violence actually took place by the time that Washington and his men got out there or got assembled. Um, the rebels had essentially dispersed. They didn't want to face down the army, but it was an important test because it proved that the United States government was much stronger under the Constitution, right? A stronger national response and you can compare this right you can compare this with Shays rebellion right which happened under the Articles of Confederation and the United States had a very weak national response and in fact it was one of the reasons as to why people like Washington called on a constitutional convention so uh, being able to put down re rebellions in your own country was a good way for the United States to prove to itself and prove to other nations that it was, in fact, a legitimate government. The Constitution was working. In terms of Indian policy, recall that the uh, Constitution uh, said that Indians were separate and that the Naturalization Act did not include Indians or Native Americans as part of U.S. citizens. At the same time, while they were separate, they were also sovereign. So the United States policy towards Native Americans is very much the same way the United States would appro uh, approach France, let's say, right? France is a different country. The French people are different. They're separate. Same thing here. Uh, after the American Revolution, 
waves of, well, not really colonists, but waves of American pushed over the Appalachian Mountains, which only increased, increased frontier violence uh, and led to more conflicts between various confederacies of Native Americans and now the United States government. The Battle of Fallen Timbers was one of these conflicts in the early years in the Ohio Territory. This was a U.S. victory. It ultimately led to the Treaty of Greenville in 1795, which gave U.S. more land in Ohio, which is the um, uh, which is the territory there. Uh, and this continued violence between the United States government and now Native Americans is going to be a theme that continues to play out. And one thing to pay attention to is the role of which you know what role do the British play in this? Because we'll talk about that a little bit later.